Starting with impurities in the additives. They're real, they're in all of them. Pure is a mythical creature or a desire that only exists in our minds. Every additive will have impurities, and some of them are toxic, but near never in a single dose. It's the 365 doses, 730 or 1,000 months to years of dosing, where they build up in the water or bioaccumulate in the coral's tissues to stress or kill them. That said, the additives we all use only need to be as pure as what the rest of our best practices support. In fact, if we do everything else right, the additive can be fairly dirty and not matter at all. It only becomes an issue when we ignore the challenges or combine multiple missteps together. Most of our additives use elements which are mined out of the ground, with a few derived from the sea. They'll all have impurities from the geological source and only be refined down as much as the application requires or the retail price can support. But I will say in our testing, price was not a good indicator of quality at all. The most expensive options did not perform the best. A while back, we ICP MS tested calcium and alkalinity additives for impurities, four aquarium and two DIY options, and found grossly different levels of heavy metals, copper, and other impurities in them. None were perfect. Well, any impurity sounds bad. To give you an idea how much they matter, you have to do some math. For instance, when we ICP MS tested six calcium chloride sources, one of the most popular and expensive options had zinc as high as 0.6 parts per million. It's six times higher than the 0.1 that resulted in 62% growth reduction and loss of chlorophyll A in Silophora reported in a study shared in the last episode. So that 0.6 sounds bad, but you gotta remember that you may only dose 100 milliliters of that to a 400 liter tank. So that dose that contains 0.6 parts per million zinc is diluted in the tank by a factor of 4,000 and completely in material today. It would take 4,000 days or doses to get to that 0.6. However, it'd only take just shy of 700 days or two years to get to that 0.1 level that produced 62% loss growth and loss of chlorophyll A. You might see what we're talking about now with the cumulative effects that happen in two years and why they're worth considering. The question, of course, is if this is true, why are tanks not dropping left and right at two years? The answer is some tanks, or at least more sensitive corals, probably are, but nobody would pin the cause on something that we've been dosing for two years successfully, at least not without the type of knowledge that we're discussing today. However, the biggest answer is water changes. Any reasonable water change schedule makes all of this a moot point, and the zinc would never accumulate because we remove most of the zinc-polluted water and replenish it with fresh seawater with a near-complete tank turnover once or a few times a year, circumventing this problem entirely. That said, there are options we tested with more or less zinc, ranging from zero to as high as one part per million, so this is where you can use this information to your advantage. If you know that you're doing fewer water changes than most reefers, then selecting an additive option with closer to zero pollutive elements, or effectively more pure, is obviously better, and won't accumulate in the tank in the same way. This becomes even more clear why preventative water changes or dilution has higher success rates than reactionary strategies based on testing or visual assessment when you consider other elements, like two parts per million aluminum, 0.5 arsenic, 0.9 copper, 192 parts per million heavy metals, or 0.5 parts per million lithium. Well, that of course all sounds bad, but if you perform the 35% monthly, 10% weekly, or 1.5% daily water changes, it's unlikely that even this will be a major problem, as a vast majority of those elemental pollutants are exported from the tank via dilution. That said, if for whatever reason regular water changes are just not on the table for you, find one of the higher quality two parts. A visual assessment will rule out many for me. While visual clarity is no guarantee, all of the calcium additives that we've tested and mixed up visually dirty or brown or pink tints tend to also have the most and highest levels of contaminants. I personally wouldn't use anything that looks visually dirty when dissolved. If I can see them with the naked eye, it's enough. This is fairly rare, but if there's a stated grade on the container, consider it. A grade isn't a guarantee of suitability for application of reefing and supporting coral, but my experience is tech grade has a higher risk factor for pollutants. Food grade is normally as good or better than many aquarium products. USP or pharmaceutical grade better than most aquarium products. Consider ICP testing. In this case, I don't mean ICP testing all the additives. I mean ICP test your tank periodically and see what's happening every quarter or even once or twice a year in your tank. Get a deeper understanding of the chemistry trends in the tank. The reason I suggest not spending a fortune in testing all the additives against each other is it rapidly becomes irrelevant. The contaminants in the ground source minerals change as the mine moves around, the manufacturers change the sources entirely. In fact, after that round of ICP MS testing five years ago, we were disappointed that Brightwell came in first on the magnesium and BRS second. Good on Brightwell, but it also required changes from our supplier for us to up the game. 
fact is changes happen all the time, and the data like this needs to be repeated. Actual ICP test results in the tank is likely the most valuable testing point, and why many of the methods that suggest fewer water changes also couple that with ICP testing to tell you when to do those changes. The other factor is it's somewhat hard to identify when ICP testing additives, what's an intended trace element between some of them, and what is an impurity? This brings us to the next elemental pollution consideration, the methodology used by each manufacturer on what major, minor, and trace elements to include in the formulation of the additive and at what level.